have a sense of the so-called value proposition of those short riffs, now it brings up a dilemma because we go into the rehearsal space. We have, we talked at the beginning about different people write songs differently. Some come up with lyrics first, melody first. A classic thing in the kind of pop rock space is the songwriter, quote unquote, comes in with chord changes and a melody, okay? That means the rest of the song has to be fleshed out from there. And now what we're gonna try to do is figure out as different people add different parts, which of those parts are gonna be owned uh, by which person and what is the value to the overall work. The old Procol Harum song called Whiter Shade of Pale, everyone probably knows it, we're gonna play it in a second. It uh, was subject to some litigation over the past few years, finally wrapped up uh, last year. And basically the organist in the band argued that he was the one who contributed this signature melodic line that was not the melody of the song necessarily, but was an important line in it, and that he should then get separately, or at least get some rights to uh, royalties because he wasn't giving songwriting credit. Now, I was getting it off iTunes, and I couldn't find the original on iTunes. This is like, Purple Hair must have some beef with iTunes, and they wouldn't allow it, but somehow this live version from 2007 was available. Listen to the organ line. Who cares about the rest, right? So it's that great organ line. Woo, I remember that. That's the whiter shade of pale thing, right? Now, listen to this. The Bach piece. Sound familiar now? What do you think? How close? So now we're going to have two issues. And this is something that's critical, and I was starting to set up in the first part of the presentation, that as you're writing songs now, let's say I'm writing a brand new song tonight, I am sort of, in some ways, looking forward and looking backwards, okay? I would like to enforce my brand new song against any interlopers who come later on and write a song that I think copies mine. But I have to be looking kind of in the rearview mirror to see who wrote stuff before that I might be taking. Okay, but now the interesting part of it again is that if I genuinely come up with it by myself, I said to you before that the original requirement is so low that I could get copyright to it, okay? So even though a lot of times it seems like the courts and others will fall into almost a patent type analysis of prior art, well it was done before, therefore no one can do that now, that's not necessarily how the analysis should go. It has to come down to copying. Okay. So how do you then get there? Well, in the music context, what's going to happen a lot is it's a famous song from before, and then you can argue or impute almost in a way to anyone who is anywhere near a radio that they must have heard the song and copied it. This was the famous George Harrison case, right? For the lawyers in the room know that case. I should have put the clips, and I, and I didn't, but it's um, My Sweet Lord by George Harrison. Okay. He wrote it. It clearly sounded a lot like He's So Fine, okay, an earlier song from the 60s, and so he was sued. And he got up in court, right, with his guitar, right, we guitar players like to, you know, play guitar wherever we can, right. He demonstrates how he comes up with the song, because he's just hell-bent on saying, I really, this was truly original. And the court kind of not wanting to offend, you know, George Harrison of the Beatles, I I'm making that part up. I mean, it's, but there was clearly a little bit of deferential stuff going on because they basically said, well, it was sort of inadvertent copying, you know. But what's interesting is that there's, essentially the argument is there's no way you could not have heard that He's So Fine song because it was such a smash hit in the 60s. It was on every radio everywhere. I know you're saying you didn't hear it, but you must have heard it and you must have unintentionally or sort of subconsciously copied it. Okay, so that's the only way in which earlier songs can become part of, part of the prior art. But what if now our keyboardist guy in Procol Harum says, oh, I never listen to classical music. I have never listened to that, okay? Then that, that old thing, the Bach piece, should have no impact, okay? But what happens in the case? What's interesting is he does then get uh, vindicated by the court, 
Okay, it goes through some appeals. And basically they say then that he should have shared songwriting credit because that piece that he does, even as much as it sounds kind of derivative of the Bach piece, but again, that's not necessarily the right test, that was an important part of the song and it should be part of the songwriting credit. So everyone's, not everyone, but maybe others are watching that case because now you have a bunch of guys in a room, let's say, and again, the songwriter comes in with chords and a melody and then somebody puts this cool riff over the top. And let's say it's, you know, the lead guitar player. And then he goes away and he leaves the band. Okay? And then the song becomes like a big hit. And it's that riff that he made up that's really important. Okay? Now what happens? Right? You bring him in for songwriting credit. You go and you duly deposit something with the copyright office, either a recording or a notation of the song. It, you know, maybe does or does not include the riff. Okay? That's going to lead to some potential problems. Okay, now, to demonstrate this a little more, I'm actually going to play, I threatened to do this, and now I'm going to do it, play one of my own studio recordings, because it is off one of these basic, I said I, I had to make one of these derivative bass, blues bass kind of songs myself, and so I did, and now I'm going to talk to you about separating out this idea about coming in with the chords and melody, uh, and actually coming in with the guitar hook. So what's going on is I opened up all the guitars, wrote the song, did all the little vocals. Now I have a bass player, and I'm letting this run through because I want you to hear the bass run in a moment, and he does. It's separate from the main hook. Actually, before I was actually losing hair, I was in my 20s when I wrote this. It's not I me. Mean, that's a great bass line, right? Who plays bass? Anybody play bass? And he was a monster bass player. I wish he was here in Seattle and I could be in a band with him again. But now that part, that doo -doo -doo, he does on the bass. He added that. I didn't tell him how to play that. What I came in with is just this thing. Now, I did come in with the riff. So in a moment, I'm going to change the hypothetical, so to speak, and pretend I didn't come in with the riff. But I did because I'm the riff-driven guy, right? I came in with the riff. Okay, so that's how I started. That was the song to me, okay? So I didn't, you know, so I did the guitar parts, I said in the vocals, but the bass line. So should my bass guy get any protection for that? Should he get any respect? No? <laughs> You're saying yes? I, I consider this to be my song though, you know? I love him dearly, but I'm not giving him songwriting credit. <laughs> now let's listen to another part. Uh, and this is me, but now we're going to think about the difference between sort of planned parts and improvisational parts. It's like the big guitar solo. I'm waiting for this, the whole song, to play this, right? thinks that solo should be protectable. You're going to give my bass player some credit. Do I get credit for that? That doesn't make a difference, though, that I could probably not duplicate that right now in my life, right? Because I'm one of those guys that goes into the studio, and I love doing that fresh solo, right? I don't want it to be canned, okay? So I just winged it, and we had the tapes rolling, and it came out pretty well. I mean, I could probably kind of put it back together, but it wouldn't be exactly right. Does that matter? 
Okay, there are some cases on this. The famous case with the, the case with the flautist. Okay, what is being added by whom, and what is their intent? Now, let me give you an idea of a different kind of guitar solo. If you go to um, right, just setting up the basic idea of twist and shout, particularly is done by the Beatles now. Okay? Now, I would argue that I'd be more inclined to give credit to, if George actually came up with that, George Harrison for that, because it's a planned out, I see it as a clearly a planned out solo. He plays it the same way every time. It really is, in my mind, part of the composition now. And now take the sort of analogy out even further and think about bands like the Grateful Dead or other kind of jam bands. All right? And they, you know, the heart of the song, maybe there's long improvisational stretch where everyone's improvising. They capture it on tape, let's say, or digital recording now. It's a work, I guess, and there's certainly a sound recording right to it, but how do you sort of put that together, okay? So I don't have the answer for that one, and I don't know if anybody does, but this notion of whether it's done improvisationally, sort of off the cuff, or whether it's planned out, can play a role in thinking about what it is. Now, whiter shade of pale, the organist was clearly doing that line every time, right? It's a very distinct set line. It doesn't vary a lot. He may vary it stylistically a bit. Now let's go to the core riff of my song, the, um, that part. What do you think, is that protectable? This is where I'm always dying. As I say, this is the money question right now. I've set you guys all up for this, and I wanna know, do I make the cut? I tried to add my own little tweak, right? It's not just the minor third, it's that, but it's, and I got my little pause. Remember I said in the day tripper, that's important. And then here's your thing. Oh, I'm crushed. I'm always crushed about this. No one values that enough. Okay. But here's the thing, you know, people are still writing songs like this. I mean, I wrote that in, I don't know, 1989 or something. But um, people still write songs around those riffs and will continue to be faced with that question of where does it tip over? But again, I always want to draw you back to the idea that I can still get copyright protection to some degree, or certainly I can get it in the whole song, because the test of originality is low. It's just, you know, no one's played exactly that before, and I didn't copy it from everyone, anyone. But here's the interesting thing. Am I copying it because I've heard a million of those kind of blues riffs before, and I intentionally, I admitted to you, I was kind of doing my own version of one of those riffs. Is that enough to say that I copied somebody else's song? Because now what we're going to get into for one of our, our final topics is the notion of faulty covering, is what I call it. When you sort of try to copy somebody else's stuff and you don't quite hit the mark, does it matter that you intended to? If you fail to do it, maybe it just shouldn't matter. It's like no harm, no foul, right? I've been trying to argue for a few years, and Bill, Bill knows this. I never quite get to the point where I'm confident enough to put this article out there, but that it really is all about style. And I say this just because the lawyers in the room know that copyright, you know, and courts often try to say, well, we don't want copyright to really protect style, stylistic performances. That's sort of the embellishment of the performer, okay? At most, you get your sound recording right for that great performance. The underlying composition is separate. When you do your version of it, you know, you're still just doing a cover of the song. You're doing a version of the song, okay? But I want to argue that, in fact, it's all about the style, and in particular because through the 20th century, and including today, you have what I call the merger of the composer and the performer. Right? This is not a new idea, but it's something that we have to, you know, focus on, is that before that time, you had a lot of composers who many times didn't perform their works, not publicly, they didn't do the big version of it. You had a virtuoso singer, player, whatever, who, who did the uh, performance of it. But the merger of that, we've come to expect our artists, our artists, to write their songs and perform their songs. And we actually want to, to listen to those ones that bring a distinct perspective or point of view. It becomes about the context of the music. Oh, it's interesting that it's that same old kind of riff, but they've given this new twist to it, okay? So I'm gonna to start to argue that the very thing that makes something at all original is that somebody has intentionally or otherwise changed the rules, changed the parameters of what came before. Now we have a couple of imitation cases, okay? 
which are where commercial parties, companies, in one case Frito-Lay and the other Ford Motor Company, like the style of someone so much, we're going to jump out of copyright for a moment to see how we're going to do this though, but like the style so much that they actually hired singers to imitate that singer, in one case Tom Waits, in the other case Bette Midler, and to also then come up with music that either in the Bette Midler case was a song she had performed, and in Tom Waits' case was to write a Tom Waits-like kind of song. So that's the interesting thing you can say. Like, I love Neil Young. You know a Neil Young song coming a mile away, right? You can hear it. I mean, if you like him at all, or maybe you don't like him, and then you want to run away from it. But there's a lot of songwriters that, oh, that's got to be song by person X. But the only way you can say that is there's a somehow recognizable style that plays through across all these things. Now, let's take it out to an extreme, though, and see what happens when we have a song and somebody purportedly sort of covering the song, but it starts getting out to the edge. We'll start with the original. Now, we talked about this before. That's actually just distilling out the standard five, six, seven blues riff, bringing it front and center, and then we give it a melody, and that's good. Now we fast forward. How many people remember this version? I'm amused by Devo, we will stop it there, okay? What is going on there? Okay, the lyrics, you got us there. That clearly is, they're, they're covering those, okay? They're saying the exact lyrics. The phrasing is pretty different though, and then the whole rest of the song is completely different. Now there is, towards the end, they do in a token way, bring in the da 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 they do that once or twice, but that's not how the song is structured. So now the question is, what is that that Devo did? Okay, whether you like it or not, I thought it was kind of funny. Is it a copy or something else? Okay, and, well, let me change my terminology. It is a cover. Is it a cover version or not? And that's going to become important. Now let's go back to the idea of context again. If you look at, if you're a student of art history, right, and you look at sort of grander art than our pop songs we're talking about tonight, you know that it can be quite important, or maybe you feel differently about it, as to viewing an artwork in the context of its historical setting, what the artist was sort of intending to uh, push back against or signal, you know, this stuff is quite important. And I'd argue that a lot of rock music became kind of high-end in that way. A lot of it was conceptualized stuff. Devo was leading this. A lot of the new wave artists like Talking Heads, they were very much trying to make artistic statements. They were coming in it often from an art school background, and so they were trying to do, you know, almost deconstruction, if you will, of some of this, the classic rock uh, sort of canon, okay? So as they're doing this, though, that's great. We want our artists to be doing creative, artistic stuff. But then we jump and we put our law hat on and we say, so what are you doing for purposes of rights and protections and things like that, okay? Now here's what a cover is that's entitled to the compulsory license under Section 115. For the non-lawyers, why is this important? Well, because if it's a cover, then you get the compulsory license, which means that, and we'll read the language in a second, so long as the original you know, composer has authorized it to be put out into the public you know, in a version already once, then anyone basically has the right to do a new version of the composition, and they have to pay set fees for doing so. But they don't need permission of the composer to do it. So if a compulsory license includes the privilege of making a musical arrangement of the work, so you get to arrange it, you get to monkey with it a little bit. To the extent necessary, though, extent necessary, we're limiting that, to conform it to the style or manner of interpretation of the performance involved, but the arrangement shall not change the basic melody or fundamental character of the work and shall not be subject to protection as a derivative work under this title except with the express consent of the copyright owner. So what do you think? Is the Devo version 
a cover that's going to fall under the compulsory license? Now, there are a number of times when we start to see these kinds of, you know, taking a lot of liberties with it, okay? So if it's not a cover then, what are the implications for that, okay? Well, if it's not a cover, then it's some sort of either unauthorized copy or even a derivative work. But again, for the non-lawyers, the original composer has the right to control derivative works, new versions made. Now, normally we think about derivative works as there's a book and somebody's going to make a movie version out of it. Okay, so we're sort of jumping into different media. We're doing something very different with it. But if it's a derivative work now, then you'd have to go and get permission from the composer to do that. And this, in some ways, gets us to the famous uh, Pretty Woman case I alluded to earlier, and the lawyers all know this case. Uh, the non-lawyers don't. It's that Two Live Crew did a version of Pretty Woman, and they ended up being sued over it by Acuff Rose, the holder of the copyright for the Roy Orbison Pretty Woman song. And the interesting thing at the outset was you'd say, well, why was there even an issue? <clears throat> it shouldn't have just been a cover covered by a compulsory license. But one of the issues that comes up is the song was so changed from the original version that it seemed to fall outside of that. And so then they did need the, the permission to do it. And so how did they have to defend themselves since they ended up not being able to get the permission? So this is the problem. If the composer won't give you the permission, now you can't do it. Two Live Crew went ahead with it nonetheless. And of course, we all know the famous part of the outcome that they tried to bring it under the parody fair use. We're making fun of Roy and his song. So because we're doing that, it should be exempted there. So this means then that as you're going through and doing your original songs and then doing cover songs, and you're doing creative things, taking a lot of license, I use that in the informal sense, license with somebody else's work because you want to make an artistic statement. You have to be very careful of that depending where you end up with it. So that's what I want to end up on now. There's so much more, as I say, only so much time. Uh, I think that, you know, again, as we've seen tonight, composers understanding a little bit about the legal side, you know, we don't want you to start worrying too much about the law, feel free to be creative, do what you want to do, but start thinking about these issues of who's going to own it, what exactly is being covered, which parts of the song can be covered and what can't be covered, and that will help you then avoid a lot of headaches down the road. Okay, you'll know what you're getting into as you get into it. Okay? On the lawyer side, I would argue that if you don't know music that well, it is actually quite helpful because understanding what the composer is doing, understanding how they're building off of pre-existing forms, understanding what are truly building blocks and what are things where the building block has been morphed enough where maybe we should allow it some protection, can then help us, I think, continue to have better outcomes for looking at litigation over music copyright. And with that, I'll end it. Thank you for your attention, and I'll stay around for questions. Thanks.